Beginning soon after World War II and continuing into the 1980s, the Japanese economy grew at an astonishing rate, unprecedented in Japanese history and arguably unprecedented in the history of the world. The overall numbers are incredible. In the 20 years between 1955 and 1975, the Japanese economy grew more than 435%. That's inflation adjusted, that's real growth. So no wonder economists refer to this as the period of the Japanese miracle. Now in the early 21st century, the chatter is all about the Chinese economic miracle. But two things make the Japanese case notable in my mind. First, it set the precedent for the rest of Asia. The idea that Westerners would buy an expensive durable good, like a TV or a car, from a faraway East Asian country, that trail was blazed by Japan. In the 1950s, made in Japan meant cheap novelties, but by the 1980s, Made in Japan meant high quality, innovative products. And the second thing that makes the Japanese economic miracle stand out is that this entire run of growth from the 1950s onward occurred during a period of free and openly contested elections in a stable multi-party democracy. So think by comparison of Taiwan and South Korea two countries that also saw dramatic growth in the latter half of the 20th century. Well, that growth was initially fostered under one-party rule or military rule. Now, both of those countries made relatively peaceful transitions to multi-party democracies. Mainland China is still a work in progress on that score. But in Japan, there was never a dictatorship to force from power. So in the 1980s, political scientists were writing books like Japan as Number One. They observed that Japan had high rates of economic growth, high income equality, high literacy, high life expectancy, virtually no street crime, free and fair elections, labor unions. And the question was, what's the secret formula? Can anyone bottle this? Of course, since the 1990s, the, the bloom is off that rose. And 20 years of sluggish economic growth mean that Japan is no longer the economic model it used to be. But for today, let's stick with the boom years. And above all, let's ask the question, why did the Japanese economy grow so fast? Well, I'm going to identify and discuss six factors over the next few minutes. And here's the first. The Japanese economy grew rapidly after World War II because the U.S. wanted it to. The U.S., which was nearly half the world economy in the post-war era, wanted Japan to be a model of capitalism for the developing world. China had gone communist. India was politically neutral. Korea was divided and devastated by war. So if anyone was going to believe that industrial capitalism could succeed outside the West, the U.S. needed a success story. The U.S. needed to Japan to become both an export giant and an industrial giant. Now, a key element of this strategy was a cheap yen. In 1949, the value of the yen was set low against the dollar, 360 yen to the dollar. This encouraged Japanese exports by making Japanese products seem cheap to American consumers. And for many years, the Japanese economy was so small that the U.S. could easily absorb its exports without any impact on U.S. industries. You can see the widespread support for this policy in a 1960 Time magazine cover. The image is of a Japanese phoenix rising from burning rubble. Behind the phoenix are gleaming new factories, chemical plants, oil tanks, 
and huge ships and office buildings. And there in the foreground, beaming with pride, is the Japanese Prime Minister, Kishinobusuke. Now Henry Luce, who owned Time magazine, was a passionate anti-communist. And although he had supported the Chinese Nationalist Party, the Kuomintang, against Japan during World War II, he was now committed to supporting Japanese capitalism against communism. And in that light, it's worth noting that Prime Minister Kishi had been indicted as a war criminal, mostly for his work promoting the economic development of Manchuria. But charges against him were dropped and he was rehabilitated, partly because the US became more concerned with making Japan an anti-communist model than with punishing Japanese militarism. So the role of the US is beyond question. And when the biggest economy in the world wants your economy to grow, that's a big help. But the second big factor in Japan's stunning economic growth was largely homegrown. And that was its cheap and motivated workforce. While much of Japan's industrial plant was destroyed in the war, its workers still had the experience of the basic rhythms of industrial life, showing up on time, punching a time clock. And the process of pulling workers out of the fields and into the cities, that had happened in the 1910s and the 1920s. Now, here we get to multiple causes. Japanese labor was fairly quiescent, in part because Japan's unions were fairly apolitical. And that's partly because from the late 1940s, with the intensification of the Cold War, the US occupation barred communists from union activity. But workers were also highly motivated because during all those years of economic growth, Japanese management made sure that the gains showed up in worker paychecks. And in many large companies, workers could count on lifetime employment. By convention, large companies didn't lay off full-time workers during recessions. And workers were assumed to reciprocate by sticking with their employers, rather than seeking higher wages at rival firms. And that sense of allegiance to a company was also supported by the corporate pay scale. In Japan, the management to worker salary ratio was astonishingly small. Today, the average US CEO makes in a day what an average worker makes in a year. The ratio is roughly 350 to 1. That's up from about 40 to 1 in the 1980s. But in Japan, the ratio was still in the teens as late as the 1990s. So for all these reasons, workers actually felt a connection to their employer. So if management told the Mitsubishi auto workers that they were part of the Mitsubishi family, it seemed reasonable. Mitsubishi was a steady employer, and the Mitsubishi management felt like part of the same broad middle class. And workers could easily be convinced that the real enemy was not management, but their rivals at Toyota. Now a third and related factor was quality. Japanese businesses took these motivated and cooperative workers and got them to embrace quality targets. A widespread corporate practice was to treat workers with respect and dignity and pay them well and tell them that quality should be their goal and praise workers who pointed out defects or inefficiencies, get their insights into how to improve quality and reduce defects and thereby make everyone in a company responsible for and proud of the product. So where did Japanese companies get these ideas? Well, here, Japanese industrials were incredibly devious. They actually listened to the recommendations of their American advisors. Pretty tricky, huh? In particular, Japanese businessmen for decades celebrated one advisor. William Edwards Deming. In fact, in 1951, the Union of Japanese Scientists and Engineers created the Deming Prize in his honor, 
and it would be another three decades before he would re was recognized in the US. Deming was an engineer and a statistician, and he was actually brought to Japan by the US occupation to work on the 1951 Japanese census. But he also gave an influential series of lectures on quality control. That was his actual passion. Now, Deming's early work has since been eclipsed by total quality doctrines like TQM and Six Sigma. But Deming pioneered the key ideas behind those later doctrines. First and foremost, quality is not about removing defective products at the end of the assembly line. It's about not making defective products in the first place. Every stage of management and production should be geared towards making a perfect product. And in that way, the final inspection, before the product goes to the consumer, that becomes simply a confirmation of a great job. Now, in the 1950s, Deming's ideas were radical. Managers, he insisted, should not be feared. Their job was not to discipline workers. Instead, Deming said that workers want to be productive and efficient and proud of their work. Managers just make that happen. Today, we would say managers should empower workers, but Deming just said they need to help people and machines and gadgets do a better job. He also told managers to honor every worker's right to pride of workmanship. I find that idea breathtaking. Workers have a right to pride in their work. Now, overall, Deming's idea was that poor quality is the result of bad management. Because if your workers actually want to make a great product, well, then managing is just helping workers do what they already want to do. Now, Japanese businessmen heard Deming's talks and seminars, and they were amazed. Akio Morita, the founder and CEO of Sony, he spoke of Deming's lectures as quasi-religious experiences. Akio said he never thought the same way again. And following Deming's lead, Japanese manufacturers began integrating design and production to lower defects and improve quality. And they included advice from shop floor workers, and they made the goal of constantly improving manufacturing techniques part of their corporate culture. And remember, in this quest for high quality, Japanese companies already had the advantages of relatively low wages and an artificially low currency. If you add high quality products to the mix, that explains a lot of double digit growth. So we've explored three factors that drove the Japanese economic miracle. Vigorous US support, a cheap and motivated workforce, and an emphasis on quality. And here's a fourth big factor. From the 1950s well into the 1970s, Japanese companies benefited from research and development conducted in the West. Companies in the US and Europe developed cutting edge technologies, which they were willing to license or sell to Japan. One example is the liquid crystal display. RCA actually developed the LCD, which is now everywhere. Your smartphone display is a massive LCD. So is a flat screen TV. And yet RCA sold patent licenses to Japanese companies which then pioneered massive LCDs and dominated the market. And this happened in multiple industries. Japanese steelmakers were quick to adopt the basic oxygen process furnace. Even though the original patent was British and the experimental prototype was American. So why did Western companies sell or license their patents instead of developing those products on their own? Well, one obvious reason was that the Japanese were starting from scratch. For example, the US was slow to adopt new steel technology 
because the industry already had a huge infrastructure in place. It would have been a really tough decision to start tearing down working steel mills to try a new technology, and an experimental technology at that. But the war had destroyed much of Japan's infrastructure. They were building from scratch anyway. And there was something deeper. In the post-war period, Japanese companies were largely insulated from short-term market forces. They could afford to try new technologies, technologies requiring years of development, and they could bear those costs, even if it meant short-term losses. When the U.S. electronics industry and auto industries were collapsing, Akio Morita famously said, the one thing he would change about U.S. business culture is quarterly financial reporting. That, he argued, made it impossible to do the sort of long-term investment needed for innovation. So what was different in Japan? What insulated Japanese companies from short-term market forces? Well, that question brings us to our fifth big factor behind Japan's economic miracle, the financing of Japanese business. You see, during the post-war boom, Japanese businesses relied more on loans than on stock sales. Japanese businesses, even big businesses, were a lot like U.S. small businesses. They weren't reliant on big public stock offerings. Instead, they borrowed money. And that meant that government loan guarantees were incredibly powerful. If you needed a bank loan for your business, you could go it alone, or you could follow the government's economic plan. Now, as part of the government's economic plan, the Japanese government targeted key industries for growth, and then it supported them by guaranteeing their bank loans. So while government ministry guidelines were technically voluntary, if you followed government advice and you built a steel plant in compliance with the government's plan to develop a steel industry, well, then you got a steady line of credit. And not just from official government banks, but also from private lenders. Now, that question of investment capital, that gets us into another key aspect of post-war industry. Many Japanese companies were part of complex webs of cross-ownership and investing. So when Japanese corporations did raise capital by selling stock, the investors were often affiliated companies. And when they got loans, it was often from affiliated banks. In Japanese, these webs of affiliated companies are called keidetsu. The major keidetsu of the post-war era were Mitsubishi, Mitsui, Sumitomo, and Yasuda. And the largest keidetsu had affiliates in virtually every industry. The Mitsubishi Group, for example, is today comprised of over 500 major companies, including Mitsubishi Motors, Mitsubishi Aircraft, Mitsubishi Steel, Nikon Corporation, Mitsubishi Plastics, Mitsubishi Paper Mills, Kirin Brewery Company, and the Bank of Tokyo Mitsubishi UFJ, which was for a century known simply as Mitsubishi Bank. Most Keiretsu had pre-war roots. Some go back to the 1800s. And the occupation briefly considered breaking them down into small independent companies. But that plan was shelved as part of the Cold War goal of rebuilding Japan's economy. So the reforms were limited to some rather superficial restructuring. Now, in terms of investment, Mitsubishi affiliates like Mitsubishi Bank funded the other affiliates. And in addition, the different affiliates all bought each other's stock. And they all bought each other's products. Mitsubishi cars were built with Mitsubishi steel. And all those sorts of deals insulated the companies from any quarter-to-quarter -quarter market pressures. So, if Mitsubishi Aircraft or Mitsubishi Motors had a rough quarter and their profits plummeted, their access to investment capital was virtually unchanged. 
Mitsubishi Real Estate didn't dump their shares. Investors didn't demand immediate cost cutting to restore profitability. Mitsubishi Bank didn't call in a loan. They were all in it together for the long term. Now, it's difficult to quantify exactly how powerful the Keidetsu were during Japan's era of rapid growth. But we can say that until the financial crisis of the 1990s, nearly 60% of the large firms in the Tokyo Stock Exchange were affiliated with one of six large Keidetsu. And the Japan Fair Trade Commission has estimated that almost 90% of domestic business transactions were among parties involved in a long-standing relationship of some sort. And this is a good place to pivot to a sixth and final factor in Japanese economic growth, the role of the Japanese government itself. Now we've already touched on loan guarantees, but how else did government policy drive economic growth? Now, direct government action was extremely important in the early post-war era. There were several Japanese ministries that promoted economic development. The Ministry of International Trade and Industry, known as MITI, was initially the most powerful. And in the 1950s, MITI targeted several key sectors for growth. The first sectors included steel, electric power, shipbuilding, and chemical fertilizers. And then came synthetic textiles, plastics, and automobiles. And in order to promote these industries, MITI, as I noted, either offered direct government loans or provided loan guarantees to private banks. And it offered government land at low cost. And it offered special tax breaks. Everything from accelerated depreciation of capital costs to exemptions from income tax. And there's little question that these policies worked because Japan became the biggest shipbuilder in the world in the 1950s. And nearly 60% of that industry's capital came from government banks. But equally important was the government's inaction, its failure to break up cartels, even when those cartels were in clear violation of Japanese law. Japan did have anti-monopoly and fair trade laws, but for decades the government did not enforce laws on price fixing or other forms of collusion. In fact, it allowed and even encouraged keidetsu. A prime example is the Japanese electronics industry. Miti had a small direct role. It promoted Japanese research in transistors. But more important was the government's role in allowing Japanese electronics industry members to fix prices. In the 1960s and 1970s, seven major firms actively colluded to sell televisions at or below cost in the US, while charging more than twice as much for comparable products in Japan. And they were able to do this because they had tight control over the domestic retail system. Most Japanese retailers were small shops, and they were rewarded with special support if they sold at the official price. And they were threatened with a supply cutoff if they tried to cut prices. And there were no independent retailers big enough to push back against price fixing. Now, in the case of TVs, when the gap in prices became known in Japan, Miti felt that they had to explain the gap without acknowledging price fixing. So they asked the electronics industry to explain why a TV costing 150,000 yen, or about $415 in Japan, cost only 65,000 yen, or about $180 in the US. And the explanations were completely ridiculous. The industry claimed that 19,000 yen of the difference was due to high sales costs in Japan. But then the Retailers Association refused to take the blame. They insisted that they weren't seeing huge profit margins. And the electronics industry further claimed that 15,000 yen in difference was because Japanese TVs were of higher quality in Japan. 
which no one believed either. And finally, the industry said that 16,100 yen indifference was due to other. They didn't even try to explain that. Now this lame explanation got a terrible public response, and the Japanese public was so angry that the Japanese Homemakers Association organized a brief boycott of TV sales. So the industry had to back off a little. They signed a consent decree with the Japanese Fair Trade Commission, and they lowered the differential between US and Japanese prices from over 100% more in Japan only about 60% more. And then they went on fixing prices, both domestically and in the US market. So why was Japan selling TVs so cheaply in the US? Well, the basic goal was to gain market share and drive US producers out of business, and both strategies worked. The number of US TV manufacturers fell from 27 in 1960 to five in 1980. Meanwhile, Japanese manufacturers gained something close to 50% of the US market. And then they carefully coordinated price increases so that they were no longer selling on tiny or even negative margins. Now in the 1970s, these practices drew a hostile response in the US. The Japanese economy had gotten so big that America just couldn't keep absorbing Japanese imports. And the US-Japanese relationship changed. The US shifted from promoting Japanese exports to blocking them. This was an incredibly rapid change. In a period of just a few years, the US abandoned its support for the cheap yen, and between 1971 and 1973, the yen appreciated by 20% against the dollar. And by 1980, it was up 50%. Also, the US began introducing tariffs to block imports from Japan. In fact, Nixon insisted that he had the authority as president to impose the tariffs without congressional approval because of the 1917 Trading with the Enemy Act. That decision did not play well in Tokyo. And this was part of a still broader shift in US policy. Remember that Japan was supposed to be the Asian capitalist success story. It was supposed to be the antidote to Chinese communism. But that storyline also began to break down in the 1970s. Nixon flew to China, chatted with Mao, and began the process of recognizing the People's Republic rather than Taiwan as the government of China. Now in Tokyo, this was a complete shock. The Japanese foreign ministry had not been given advance notice. They found out from public media. And coming on top of those developments was the 1973 oil crisis. And as a US ally, Japan was specifically targeted as part of the OPEC embargo. And the Japanese economy suffered as oil prices rose 300% in just a few years. Now, in the 1970s, many suggested that this was the end of Japan's economic growth, because many of the fundamentals of Japanese post-war growth were gone. US support for exports, gone. A cheap yen, gone. Cheap labor, all gone. But the Japanese economy actually rebounded from the crisis of the early 1970s rather quickly, and growth continued, although at a slower rate down from about 8% per year to, to around 4. Japanese companies also adapted to the new relationship with the US. They began moving production to the US to work around import restrictions. And they also began buying American companies. For example, Panasonic bought the consumer electronics division of Motorola to maintain access to the US market. And the rise in gas prices gave Japanese cars an advantage since Japanese automobiles were quicker to raise fuel efficiency. And Japanese car companies moved up in the market. As early as 1983, Toyota began planning the Lexus. Now, Japanese cars were already known as cheap and reliable, 
But now Toyota began planning for luxurious and reliable. And finally, Japanese domestic demand began to grow. After decades of growing incomes, Japanese consumers finally stopped thinking of wartime privation and they began spending. So Japan became less dependent on exports for growth. Now in retrospect, that feeling of wealth had a downside. Because while it fueled domestic demand, it also supported a huge real estate bubble. Japanese consumers were feeling wealthy and they wanted bigger houses. And as a result, Japanese housing prices actually tripled during the 1980s. Now the bursting of that bubble and its aftermath, that's a topic for another day.